Good morning, Teen Sunday School class. Welcome to Lesson 75. Get your handout ready. We're going to fill in the blanks as we go along. I want to talk to you today about how to follow the wrong leader. How to follow the wrong leader. We're going to look in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 through 7. You know, all of us are following someone. We're following something. We all are influenced by others. We're influenced in the way we talk. Our speech uh, it comes from the, what we hear around us. We're influenced in uh, the things we do. We do things because we've been taught to do that. We've been shown to do that. We've, we've learned that from others. All of us are influenced by something or someone. Uh, just look at the advertising in America. Advertising is one of the most dominant parts of our culture here in America. It's in everything. It's everywhere. What do advertisers do? They try to influence the way you think, the way you act, the way you buy. <laughs> they do this by presenting something as being wonderful. You know, if you have this product, life will be wonderful. Life will be happy. You will be satisfied. They present this perfect picture, and they make you think that if you're a part of that, you'll be that as well, if you buy their product. They try to influence you that everybody's doing it, <laughs> and so you need to do it too. Well, just like advertising, the world around us is trying to get us to follow their example as well. And we have all these leaders propped up, these these people that we follow. And we need to be so careful about who we make as our leaders. So let's talk about how to follow the wrong leader. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 through 7. Let's start there. 1 Samuel 8, verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when he said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, in that they say unto thee, For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. First of all, I want us to notice point number one, the wrong leader is chosen using the wrong reasons. They have all the wrong reasons for choosing this leader. And we're going to jump down a little bit to see the first reason we're going to come to. In fact, uh, let's jump down to chapter 9 and uh, look, at verses two, look at verse 2 with me. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice man and a goodly and there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he, for his shoulders and upward he was higher than any of the people. So they choose Saul because he was a goodly person. This word goodly just means he was good looking. And he was taller than all the other people. Um, they chose him because he was good looking. It, it, when he entered the room, uh, all the girls... <laughs> did a little giggle and started twirling their hair and all the guys sucked in their breath and lifted up their chest to make themselves look a little bigger and bolder. It, it, they took notice when this guy entered the room. He was a good looking man. You know, we make our leaders based on what we see on the outside. Our influence comes to us from what we see on the outside. And we so often pick those influences because they're good looking. Those advertisements that come our way present the best looking picture possible. They're not gonna show you the uh, drunk in the gutter throwing up, no. They're gonna throw this, show this picture of everything being wonderful and perfect. Satan presents leaders to us all the time that influence us 
and they s show us this picture of everything being good on the outside. We need to stop picking people to be our leaders and things and influences in our lives to be leading us because they look good. We need to look for someone that's following God, for the one that has a heart for God. You see, that's what God was looking for. God was looking for a man after his own heart. Children of Israel were looking on the outside for someone to lead them that was looking good. God was looking for a man after his own heart looking on the inside. So, if you want to choose the wrong leader, you choose them for the wrong reason. You choose them because they look good on the outside. If you want to choose the wrong leader, you're going to choose them because... Well, as it says in this passage, chapter 9, verse 2, he was a choice young man. A choice young man. What does that mean? A choice young man. Well, it just it refers to his heritage, his lineage. He was spoken well of by others. He was a choice young man. In fact, if you look at chapter 9, verse 1, we see his heritage there. It mentions... Uh, who He was of the tribe of Benjamin, and uh, there was a man named Kish, the son of Abel, the son of Zeor, the son of Bechoroth, the son of Aphria, the uh, Benjamite, a mighty man of power. So what a lineage, what a heritage this guy had. Not just his father mentioned, who was a mighty man of power, but his grandfather Great fa grandfather and his great 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 grandfather. Uh, that's quite a heritage. And he was very well spoken of by others. But we need to be careful not to choose a leader or an influencer in our life just based upon the fact that others say they're good or based upon the fact that they say, uh, well, they're Christian, aren't they? They're a Christian. Well, well, they, they go to a Baptist church, so it must be right. Well, it's written from a Christian perspective. Or, oh, well, th that movie had a, a Christian artist involved in it, so it, it surely is good. That music, uh, oh yeah, that music's cr good Christian music because it had Christian words, right? Have they mentioned God in there? Well, we need to be so careful that we don't just follow leaders because they are spoken of well by others. So they're choosing King Saul based on his reputation. His rep reputation was a wonderful thing. All, all of us should have a good reputation. Reputa a reputation is what someone else sees in your life or thinks of you. And uh, they ought to think highly of you. Reputation is the conclusions that they draw. Every Christian young man ought to have an excellent reputation. But a reputation does not substitute for a godly testimony. A testimony is what someone sees in your life and thinks about God. And that's far more important. David had a reputation and a great... didn't just have... Uh, let me say it again. David didn't just have a good reputation. He had a godly testimony. Saul had a great reputation. So the wrong leader was chosen, and it made them the wrong people. It made them like other nations. That's what they wanted, right? Uh, chapter 8, verse 5, uh, that they would judge us like all the nations. And then again, uh, let's read chapter 8, verses 19 through 22. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So they wanted to be like everyone else. So the wrong leader was chosen, and it made them the wrong people made them like all the other nations. Sad but true, they wanted to be like others. 
Satan's constantly trying to compress us into the mold of this world. But we should not be conformed to this world. We should be transformed. We should be different. Don't look down on those that lead you in the right path. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Don't get tired of being different. Let your light shine for Christ. They didn't realize it, but in choosing to be just like the world, they were making the choice to be in bondage. You see, that's what the world is. They're slaves of sin. They're in bondage to sin. Look at what Samuel says it's going to be like for them if they choose a king. Uh, in verse 10, uh, let's start in verse 10. And Samuel told all the words of the people, Lord unto the people, that asked of him a king. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots, and he will appoint him captains over thousands, and captains over fifties, and he will set, he will set them to ear his ground, and to reap his harvest, to make his instruments of war and instruments of chariots. And it will be that he will take your daughters to be confectionaries, and to be cooks, and to be bakers, and he will take your field, and your vineyards, and your olives, and even your best of them, and give them unto his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed in the vineyards, and, he, and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants, and your maid servants, and your goodliest young men, and your asses, and put them to his work. And he will take the tenth of your sheep, and ye shall be his servants." And ye shall cry out in that day because of the king which you have chosen, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. What a choice that they make. You see, the difference between choosing a king and having a judge is clear. A judge to, uh, would come on the scene to give them uh, victory over the enemies, but to follow the judge was voluntary. Following a king, that's not voluntary. You're required to. You follow a judge into battle, that's your choice. The judge led them into battle. The king forces them, commands them, rules over them. They will be servants to the king. Romans 6.16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. So they become slaves to the king. And then the king leads them to rebellion. Where do you get this? Well, jump down to chapter 13, verse 8. In chapter 13, verse 8, we see that the Philistines are about ready to make war. And King Saul is in the valley there, distressed. He sees how many of the multitudes of the Philistines are about ready to come in and destroy. And uh, he tries to do the right thing. Verse 8 says, And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And we know the rest of the story that Saul went on to make the sacrifice himself. There was only one person that Saul was to submit himself to, and that was Samuel. King Saul had one person that he was supposed to listen to, Samuel. <laughs> King Saul, was, is, he's over the military. He's uh, appointed over everything, even the politics. Uh, but he was not in charge of of the religion of the nation, in charge of listening to the voice of God. He was not to do the sacrifice. But by Israel picking Saul as their king, Saul leads them down the path to rebelling against his God-given authority. If you read through the Old Testament, it's pretty amazing how awful King Saul is as a military general, as a leader, as, as a king. Uh, he, he's probably the worst uh, military leader 
on the face of the earth. Uh, every time you read about King Saul, he's leading his people into a place where there's no retreat, no clear means of attack. Uh, you see him chasing around David what seems like forever, and he never is able to catch him. King Saul only has one person that he's supposed to listen to, Samuel, and uh, there's just one area that he's responsible for. He's not allowed to do the sacrifice but then he chooses to overstep his ground bounds. There's not a single reason in the world why you should ignore and disobey God-given authority in your life. Romans chapter 13 tells us, Let every soul be subject unto the higher power, for there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. And yet we oftentimes in our lives make excuses for disobeying God-given authority. I want to give you four excuses right now. Excuses we often use, and I think that King Saul used, to disobey God-given authority in his life and led the nation of Israel down this path of rejecting authority. First of all, he gave the excuse that he was important. His importance gave him permission to disobey. King Saul was pretty important. He was the king, right? No matter how important you think you are, you don't have a right to disobey God-given authority. Been in church so long, we start to think we're pretty important. We've, we've done so much for God, we think, well, I, I can get, you know, God will let me do this. I can do this little thing. It's no big deal. I don't care how long you've been going to church, how much you've given in the offering. It doesn't give you a right to disobey God-given authority doesn't give you permission to stray away from God. But next we see here that his intentions gave him permission to disobey, or seemingly did. He had the right intent. He, he, had the right, he, he meant well. He was trying to honor God, right? He was trying to please God. He was trying to do what's right. We need to do the sacrifice. Don't get hung up on intentions. The right intentions don't make it right for you to do. King Saul had good intentions, but he was wrong. I don't care what your intentions are, you don't have permission to disobey God-given authority in your life. Your importance doesn't give you permission. Your intentions don't give you permission, and your impatience doesn't give you permission. King Saul was impatient. Now, you're a teenager, especially when you're a teenager, uh, you have this impatience about you. And that's only natural. You turn 11 and you can't wait until you turn 12 and get to be part of the youth group. Uh, and then you can't wait till you turn 15 so you can get your learner's permit. And then you can't wait till you're 16 so you can get your driver's license. Then you can't wait till you turn 22. And, get off out into the world and go to college. Uh, you can't wait until the next thing. It always seems like there's something more down the road and, and you're impatient to get there, but be careful. Your impatience does not give you permission to be disobedient. Your impatience does not give you permission to overstep your bounds. God-given authority. Don't be impatient. Wait on God. Wait on His timing. Don't make excuses like Saul did. Number four, Saul made an excuse to disobey God-given authority based on the imperfections of others. Others' imperfection gave him permission. What do I mean by that? Well, in 1 Samuel, we see that chapter 13, verse 8, And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. Samuel said he was going to be there at the set time. He, he's the one that set up the time. But Samuel came not. Ooh. Samuel was late. Samuel had let him down. 
Samuel wasn't perfect. Let me say this, your parents, they're not perfect. Mr. Ripple is not perfect. Your God-given authority, it's not always perfect. But that is never an excuse to disobey. It's never an excuse to go against what God has placed in your life. So the wrong re leader was chosen for the wrong reasons, and he led the people to be the wrong kind of people. He led them to be like other nations. He led them into bondage. He led them into rebellion. And rebelling against God-given authority. But, hey, at least they got a king, right? At least they got a king to lead them into their battles and fight their battles for them. We'll fast forward a little bit to David and Goliath. Where do we see King Saul? Fighting the battles for them? No. He's afraid, sitting on the sidelines. Be careful who you choose to be your leader. And it all boils down to this, Roman numeral 3, the wrong leader is chosen because they chose to reject God. That's why they chose the wrong leader. Because they chose to reject God as their king. Verse 7 of chapter 8. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Will you be the right kind of leader? What influences and leaders have you allowed into your life? And have you chosen to be the right kind of leader to others? Is God king of your life? Is God first place in your life? Because you know what? If you're putting God first place in your life and God is king in your life, then you're going to have the right kind of leaders, the right kind of influences that you will choose to be your influence. Don't follow the wrong leader, but start being the right leader for God. Start taking a stand for God. Where the Christian life and be a Christian that has the, the Christian life as a badge of honor for him. Ask yourself, how can you be the right kind of leader in church? How can you be the right kind of leader that doesn't make excuses for disobeying God, but chooses to make him king and allow him to be reigning over you in your life? The world over here with its influences and lures says, come on over here. Life's wonderful over here. There's pleasures. There's comfort. <laughs> There's happiness. Life's exciting over here. Come on over. Try this out. But the sad reality of that life, of the world, is that that is bondage. And that is rebellion against God. God wants us over here to follow Him. Let Him rule and reign in our lives. Listen to what He says. Obey what He says. Go where He wants us to go. Think like He wants us to think. Be the kind of person He wants us to be. And wear our Christian life like a badge of honor and be different and peculiar, special for Him. Be a man after God's own heart. Don't follow the wrong leader. Start being the right kind of leader for God.